conference. We're here with Ralph Lopez. Eric. I'm not Ralph. Yeah, that's Eric and I'm Ralph. Ralph. There's Ralph. And then we have Dwayna over here. She'll jump in in a bit. And just well, whoever wants to come up and chat, we're see having her. a beer wine. You can barely see her here. Yeah. Yeah, she's uh, in the election of justice work. There's Ralph and the there end. she is. End of a long day of election justice work. We had a very good day. It was very productive. The enthusiasm in the room was amazing, and you will be hearing more about having an honest vote in America come back so we know who we really elected. That's right, and we've got to keep them from wrapping up our votes and storing them in the hallways. Now that's wrap up, wrap up. There you go. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's right. We are actually to find out who really won this election, Buffoon number one or Buffoon number two. We're going to count every single vote in this election. Uh, Ralph, tell us a little bit about more about what you and your role is in organizing Massachusetts. Uh, what we're doing in Massachusetts is really very simple. We are suing the Secretary of State to view the actual hand-counted ballots in the 2016 Democratic primary, which we have reason to believe was stolen by Hillary Clinton, by Bernie Sanders, from Bernie Sanders. Some of the reason that we believe this is in districts where the ballots were hand counted, counted by hand, Bernie won by nearly 20%. Okay? Keep that figure in your mind. In districts where the ballots were counted by automatic machine, which can be hacked, Hillary won by about 1%. So we have a 20% discrepancy for which there is really no non-nefarious reason. So we're going to find out what's in those ballot boxes and count them by hand, which is, by the way, the solution to election integrity in America. You will have heard from all these people if you view the live stream, and I implore you to do that, that what we are doing is coalescing around a program which is going to make our elections safe again and honest. And part of that is to A, have paper ballots, B, count them by hand, and C, count them by hand in full public view with observers because these ballots and these elections belong to us. There should be absolutely not a single solitary thing secret about them. So in Massachusetts, who are and how do you doing is uh, a little bit different. Five and minutes, five minutes, five know, minutes. <laughs> He's being silly because I'm glad that What people need to know is that you do not need a lawyer to file a lawsuit. You can do something called filing pro se. Although as a lawyer, I would highly recommend having a lawyer. I, we, we highly recommend having a lawyer. But if you cannot, unfortunately, have a lawyer. If you don't have a Duena name in your state. Then you still have the option of doing something called filing pro se, P R O S E. Look it up. You can Google it. You will find a lot of good information. The courts make quite a bit of latitude. Uh, first of all, I want to say the courts are really not closed off for ordinary citizens who are willing to do a little research. We made everything very easy. If you go to handcountballots.blogspot.com, you will see a sample of how to do step one, step two, step three sue your own Secretary of State to count the ballots in your primary election that just happened this uh, this year. Some of the states that uh, you want to, we want to find people to follow up on that is Ohio. If you're from Ohio, you have to know about this. If you're from Illinois, if you're from Kentucky, Texas, West Virginia, or New York. If you're from Nueva York, we want you to sue Nueva York to count the ballots. And by going to that website, handcountheballots.blogspot.com, we'll tell you exactly how to do it. And if there's something that we don't know, we will find the answer for you. So tell me a little bit, and I'm going to ask Dwayne this question as well. First, you, in Massachusetts, how do you organize, or can you, or have you organized any protests? Well, I mean, I just. Who are they? The people of color? Basically, I mean, it's going to start mostly with neighbors, you know, your friends, people that you just talk to. It's really, um, it's really not that large a, a number of people at this point, but it's going to expand, I'm sure. And it really just 
starts with a couple of concerns, people talking over coffee and saying, you know, we really want to do something about this. And involve your friends and neighbors, get a few petition signatures, and then you're in business. You know, as far as your larger question, that, that's a question that people have been trying to figure out for a long time. You know, movements of the left, like this is, can reach out to minority communities. I'm a minority, but I kind of move in many worlds, so um, that's easy for me. I kind of feel like I was adopted by
that I was always taught this is that the person with the most votes wins. Yes, I understand there's like a college, okay? But still, the person who wins the popular vote in the state wins that state. That's the way it is supposed to work. However, it really is the way it's going to work. There are a lot of it that are not being counted. There's no integrity in our electoral system right now. We need to change that. We need more people active in this process. We need people participating in this process. We need people observing this process. We need people holding our registrars accountable. Amen. So my next question, don't leave, because I think you can answer this too. My next question is um, for Ralph and Duena. As a poll worker and a voter, poll ballot count processor, which is, a, I mean, an observer, ROBs count them, canvassing period, what kind of data would you poll monitors and poll workers need to gather so you can have great costumes? Um, in my opinion, I would say uh, to everybody out there, they could only do one thing on election day and they want to do something, is get out there when it opens, Vote at some point and count exactly how many people walked into that building to vote all the way through until closing and write down that number and send it to Election Justice USA so we have it on record on file um, because that number may become important at some point. Well, the end game isn't to have great lawsuits, the end game is to avoid lawsuits at all. Uh, okay, and obviously. One of the things we want to know is how many votes were cast total, how many votes were cast provisionally, how many people were not on the voting rolls at all, how many people claimed that they were wrongfully registered as a voter by mail, how many people were not registered at all, according to their own um, comments, for example. When I was a legal observer, a lot of people came in and said that I registered as a Democrat and I'm not showing up registered at all and I double checked and it turned out they weren't showing up as registered in the Secretary of State's database. I think that sort of information is very important to gather. We might want to find those people later. Um, number of provisional ballots, maybe the types of people who are forced to cast provisional ballots, were the instructions for provisional ballots accurate? And as a legal observer, you want to make sure that they're not wrongfully giving people provisional ballots. One of the problems that we saw in this last election cycle in the primary is that no party preference voters were wrongfully being given provisional ballots. That is not a valid reason to be giving provisional ballots. Another thing that I saw in the Utah caucus is people were being given provisional ballots because they ran out of ballots. Again, not a reason to give people provisional ballots. If they run out of ballots, call us immediately. That's right. So, you know, you want to make sure the polling places are opening on time closing on time, people are not being denied the right to vote, people are not being wrongfully given provisional ballots, those are the kinds of things that matter, people are being denied the right to vote wrongfully, that's very important information to gather. And the total number of votes cast in the, in the area, number of provisionals cast, the tally sheets, that sort of information, and at the end of the day, at least in my county, they have the little tape. How many people voted for this candidate versus that candidate? Those are posted outside. I think those are important pieces of information to gather. They are legally required to keep those tally sheets. That's right. But, you know. Tally sheets will be usually posted outside. Well, I think all the observers should be keeping those in any given district and make their notes. See how that matches up with the final tallies on the election day. Another way to gather information. Oh, no, no, no. I think I think that covers it. I think um, this election has been the primary was really informative to people who were observing. If you were a poll worker, when I was a poll worker, I almost felt like I became an advocate because our inspector was so bad, and he um, was so mad at me that he actually came up to me and said, "Hey." From now on, if there's a question, you have to go through me. And I was like, yeah, okay. But I realized he wasn't going to do his job. So I told him, sure. But, you know, every time we had a problem, I made the poll people who were registering people um, make the phone call to the ROV and ask the question because our inspector is not going to have the answer. So how can we be uh, more of an advocate as a poll worker? 
Well, they do actually hand you a full worker manual of instructions. You could read it. It's rather lengthy. Uh, but they're all very different. Okay, they all have sections of the election code. Okay, what to do with this situation, what to do with that situation. These are statutes that you can read. And I'm certain that these books actually refer to specific statutes, what to do with these specific situations. You can look at these statutes yourself if necessary. And, you know, it's possible if necessary, you can even contact your local friendly neighborhood lawyer and ask if this situation, then what? You know, I mean, if you've been a co-worker enough times, theoretically you should understand what you're doing. Of course, there are situations where there are people who have been co-workers so long that the rules and the laws have changed, and they don't know that. They haven't changed with the rules and with the laws. There have been situations where coal inspectors are actually people who have been doing it so long that they've actually been seen us. Now, there's no basic competency test for the poll inspector. So I think it's kind of strange that you're expecting to say, well, you have to go through me. I mean, just like there is no rule. You know, I worked for a minute for the U.S. Census, and there was a basic sort of, yeah, list of things you had to know, sort of a basic uh, level of literacy and math that you had to know to be, uh, you know, That can get very complicated, especially if we're talking about registrars who do things differently in different ways. One thing that might be useful is to get their policies and procedures in advance of how they're going to count the votes. That can be done through public records requests in each county. Sometimes that's not really to get getting these public records requests. But you know, sometimes these registrars have different ways of counting votes in each county. Um, one thing I would strongly advise against, no matter what, is passing out provisional envelopes to people. Unless absolutely must. Those are very rare circumstances. You know, if the person is not found on the voting roster anywhere, you check all the voting rosters, you check the registration, you know, if there's a legal observer, that person can check the registration. You can encourage the person to check their own registration. Call the registrar of voters and have that person check the registration. Provisional should only be the last resort, not a first resort. And then make sure that they fill out the provisional envelopes with everything accurate. Make sure that they don't put down a business address, for example. Make sure that they put down a residential address. Even though the registrar is not supposed to check the address, only the name and signature, some registrars do check the address and use that as an excuse to disqualify those. Yeah, and so you have to also check off the reason why that they are uh, using, the provisionals. using the provisionals. You know, I mean, it was mentioned earlier at this conference that, you know, they actually will process the vote by mail ballots instead of the provisional ballots. But these are legal documents that they are signing. They're swearing that they did not receive their vote by mail ballots. So I'm not really sure why it works that way. So be as careful as possible for the provisionals. Make sure everything is checked off. All the information is accurate, accurately filled out as possible. Make sure the voter reviews that. I think that's the most important thing you can do. And take your receipt, because a provisional yeah. should have a little receipt number that you should be able to go at the state level. I don't think it was. When I was a co worker, I didn't issue the ballot until the envelope was filled out. Again, there is no way to do anything as far as counting. The, um, the ballot if it's rejected at the start. 
and that's a big problem, especially in certain large counties with registrants that are excuses to just call for the ballot. We had a big, uh, we had a voter that came to us when we were advocating at a voter supervisor's office, and she said, hey, in our area, they forgot to issue receipts. And when I was a ballot count observer, I noticed that the envelopes, and they were cutting them to open up and pull out the ballot, they, the receipt was foreign. So that means they, one, they didn't give it to the person, or the duplicate that saved on all those so it can be matched with one that the person took, now has fallen. They got removed from the card. So when the, after you pull the ballot, that envelope gets separated, it goes to a staff who enters in the mid phase and your vote was processed, and some of them were marking checks, and says, oh yeah, my ballot was counted. But even the slightest thing of, as an observer, poll worker, and if you can go prior to election and say, let me see your envelope, and think about what that envelope is doing, how that's going to get processed along the way, and um, how that's going to prevent maybe someone from checking if your vote was counted. So, um, if you have any additional thoughts. Well, look, if you're a poll worker, the first thing you do before you open in the morning is you look at your checklist and materials. And you look at your materials. Okay, this is poll working 101. There's a problem with your materials. You call it a All right? You replace your materials. This shouldn't be a typical problem. We had an ROV. We asked her, um, she was called the rover. So she was hired as an inspector and she went to every site to check how they were doing. We asked her, can you bring us more provisional? Because we get right now. She's all, what's a provisional? Okay, that's ridiculous. <laughs> this should not be happening. Okay? This is the kind of thing that should be documented. You want to have a log, right? So that's where we come in. Okay, again, this should be part of the training, right? So, it's all the same thing. It should be observed by the department. 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 Right. Right. Well, you know, the way it's supposed to work is the inspector's supposed to be the person with the most experience, and the poll worker is also known as judges.
people working in Concord, I had three Republicans come up to me and say, my party's been switched. I've never been this other party. I've always been a Republican. So, but I had a majority, you know, the bigger portion of people whose parties were switched were Dems or MPPs. So, let's just, you know, remind ourselves that it doesn't matter what party you're from. You have been, could have been a victim. One other thing that I noticed is when uh, our ROV opened up the, uh, the envelope, provisional by mail, the, the ballot comes out. It gets separated from the envelope where you write your name and sign, put your address and all that. If one portion of your ballot, which is card A or card B, in general election would have card five, there's so many things on the ballot. Um, maybe if you voted in the wrong precinct, you'll have some things that count, some other things that won't count. Um, and if something did count, you know, it got put in this pile and it got counted. And if something didn't count because you voted in the precinct, wrong precinct, for example, it got put in a different pile. So, but your envelope got put away and all the stack to Stafford and then say your vote was counted. So to me, that's really what's leading. Because you think your whole ballot, all cards are counted. So, um, I don't know if there's any answer to this. I'm not sure they even give that level of detail. Do they give that level of detail they, in Alameda if, County? I'm the county, they said no. We want it. Well, I know in my county, in San Mateo County, they don't give the level of detail. After the 30 days, yeah. you switch it to the county. Okay. So they can tell you if it's counted, they're probably not going to tell you what part of it's counted. Yeah, so I think that's misleading. What if I voted uh, for Bernie or, you know, there was a Wilson on the ballot? And that didn't count, but the other part did count. You're going to tell me all of it counts. This is where the observing comes in. Yeah. That is why you need people to go to these ROVs and watch what these folks are doing. The people who are counting the votes sometimes are seasonal and <laughs> temporary. <laughs> right? And, you know, again, their level of caring and their level of confidence can vary. Okay? So some people might be very meticulous and some people just might not care. And that's why we need people standing there watching what they're doing and holding them accountable. When you see these cards get separated and, you know, the card winds up on the floor, you know, you can say something. I know that Timothy Dupree in Alameda County said, oh, no, you can't. Well, you absolutely can. You have a right to ask questions as long as you are not being disrupted you have a right to ask questions. And this time, this fall, I highly suggest you do. I think that after the primary, people were far too scared, far too shy. We let these ROVs and the other hospitals. They told us we could video or take okay. pictures. All right, you can't. Well, you know, there's some arguments. Okay. There are public employees and an arguably public location. Okay, yeah. so you can take pictures of things that are public. I can give some concern about taking pictures of something. Okay, but the ballot is secret by then the information has been removed. Right. So you should be able to take the person who's uh, counting the ballot because it doesn't identify it to you. Yeah, I mean, I would argue you could, I would suggest you don't. But I also don't think they have a right to tell you you can't use your phone call or text. Or videotape the process, maybe. You know. From far away, if you can't see it. I mean, I don't know if that's a particular battle I would take, but I can certainly stand for it. Okay. You can certainly have your phone with you. Okay? This is in prison. Yeah. All right? This is a public process. These are public employees. We are paying their salaries. Yeah. All right? Yeah. yeah. These are not prison wardens. This is not elementary school. Right. All right? We are there. They work for us. And these are our votes in the big time. They need to be held accountable. Thank you, Joanna. I'm going to let you go finish your wine. And I will find another victim, hopefully, and you'll see us uh, here back on the live stream. If I don't, then I'll see you next week on our weekly live stream. Thanks. Bye, everybody.